And our two, our two warriors have fought right on this spot here. The last surviving member of the Aboriginal Ten Embassy standing here today signing a treaty. But see that place over there at a meeting where he witnessed Malcolm Fraser and Uncle Lyle Munro across the table where he tells me that Malcolm Fraser was sitting across the other side of the table and he said, Uncle Lyle, he said, if I hand this to you, after we sign it, a Gummeroy elder sitting in that place there, look, in front of us, the Prime Minister of this country saying, if I sign it and give it to you, what happens? He said, you'll be calling me Prime Minister. That's how important these things are, I feel, and I think that's why they walk away from a treaty with our mob. But I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate the two people that are standing behind me because we fought, you know, we fight a lot. These two have fought here. I watched them on TV fighting. I watched the coppers come from that way and hinder them with batons. You know, and they spilt blood on this. I never spilt blood there, but these two spilt blood on that side, right in front of us. Thank you, Robert. I, I just want to say, um, uh, I could nearly forgot what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> no, one of the things I, I do want to say, and that is that um, it's got to be known for everybody that this becomes public now, it goes out on public display and we're going to take the copy of it goes back to the nations um, so that our people can get to see it and discuss it. And the, the good thing about it is that it's a living document. This is not a static document. And so that when the nations go and meet and talk about the treaty itself and what's in it, if they don't like it, they instruct their delegates to make changes to that and bring it back to the NBAN group and the NBAN group has a capacity under our constitution and under that treaty to be able to negotiate those changes. Because when those changes occur, it impacts on every nation, not just one nation. And so each nation has to agree to any changes or amendments to that, to that treaty. And because here we've made a commitment and when it goes out on public display, people will see the terms of what that treaty actually says. And uh, from there, um, they will, it will be seen and we make it very public that you meet with your delegates, you meet as a nation, you come together under your governance system and if you want changes made, you instruct them to make those changes and then they bring it back to the body. It's just like us, we are the governing body. Any changes that are made will impact on every other nation so those nations have to agree and, and we, we negotiate that thing. So that's part of our negotiations. It's part of our self-determining rights to be able to do those things. And this gives us the power that we really want. And I hope that um, as we begin to progress this, we will start saying this year will be made known very clearly now through the media about what has happened here. Because from now on, they will have to talk to the sovereign peoples, not to their Uncle Toms and uh, other people who are being handpicked. I would like to say a few things, you know, about those early days when we were young and energetic and idealistic. We, there was no prescription. No one told us this is what you should do to, to get this or this is something else you should do. I think we were driven by the spirit of our people in those days because we knew that everything we saw around us was wrong. I could write a book about some of the stories that I heard in my teen years uh, where people had gone to doctors. Uh, Aboriginal men in, in Hobart had gone to a doctor. Uh, this is in 1970-71 and went in with a broken leg and he came out but when they operate on that leg, they put the pin in the wrong leg, you know. There was a lot of things that motivated us in terms of setting up those early organisations like the legal service and the health service. And 
some of those things were in Queensland because a lot of young people were coming off the Aboriginal reserves and Aboriginal settlements and ending up in Brisbane, uh, still having to get permission to get off the reserves, still have to getting permission to go back on the reserves. And we set up a campaign in 1971, the Queensland Acts Confrontation Committee, and one of the most uh, intelligent men in uh, Aboriginal politics that was ever born lives down in that white tent there, Dennis Walker, in that van, in that van down there, that white van. Um, a great man, uh, a militant, a radical, who was inspirational, as was Uncle Don Brady, as were so many people. Chicka Dixon, you know, you could just go on naming so many people who inspired us. And, you know, people in those days were getting Her Majesty's pleasure. Young people who might have stolen a car. They come up before the courts in Brisbane and they give them the Queen's pleasure, doing 10, 15 years of jail, some of them. And those days were not easy because we had nothing. We did everything for nothing. That's what I'm proud of this organisation. We don't get sitting fees. We don't get paid to come to these meetings. And that's what I love about this organisation, you know, that we do it because we have a belief that whatever footprint we leave on this country, the stronger it is, the better it is for the future generations. And those days were tough, and they are still tough. We are in an epidemic now of young people who are suiciding. My son, you know, he's only in his early 30s, and he, could, he goes to a funeral almost every week of one of his cousins, one of his brothers and sisters who he knows. And the influence of drugs now and ice in our communities, these are things that we didn't have to deal with in those days. And they are big issues which affect our ability to be able to get up and still fight and exercise our rights and interests in land and waters, seas, air in this country. And I would hope that everyone who says that they believe in sovereignty, who fights for our rights, still does that hard work. Because it's the unsung heroes, it's always the unsung heroes. Those people who'll cook a feed for anyone, people they don't know, who'll give a bed, who'll lend a few dollars, who'll pick someone up when they're walking. You know, to me, they're the heroes of this country. And you continue, I continue to see them every day, every day through the work that I do. And I think that as a people, we are blessed. We are blessed because every day we can walk in our own country. There are a lot of people who can't do that, who for some reason find themselves now in our country. And we need to have a big heart, a big, a big heart, to be able to be understanding and compassionate towards other human beings. It's not just about ourselves. In exercising our rights and interests, we also have to embrace the fact that there are a lot of other nationality of people coming in this country who were ostracised, who were abused, tortured because of their rights. And these are issues of today and into the future for our young people of things that we need to be thinking about. It's not simple, what do we want, land rights, when do we want it now? The game has changed. It's got complexities and twists and turns that I certainly didn't think was going to be the state of play in 2017. But all I know is that if you as a person, as an individual, can take responsibility for your actions, be as strong 
in your convictions as you can be, then all of those young people who you are influencing, your children, your grannies, I'm like the rest of you. You know, I had seven children, 23 grandchildren, looking forward to great-grandchildren. We influence our families, we influence our clans. You know, we still perform our traditional dances. We still maintain our culture. I have danced the rivers of the Murray-Darling Basin. We had a ceremony from the beginning of where, the, where it starts, where the water starts to the end. When the country was so dry, the mouth of the Murray was dead, dying. They had dredges every day trying to open it up. That's what we're all here about when we talk about water in our meetings. That's what we're here for, to make sure that that Mundagadi can continue that journey without any fear that they will be stopped. That's our fight, that cultural fight. It's not just a physical one, it's a spiritual one as well. And in keeping our song line strong, we keep ourselves strong. So again, I just thank Nangara that I'm still here in 2017, you know, in our 60s. I hope I'm here in my 70s and 80s and 90s, but if I'm not, it doesn't matter because I've taught my children well. I've taught my grannies well. They will be here strong, dancing, singing up a storm. And when I look around you, the pain that we have all been through within our personal lives, I want to acknowledge all of our people who've passed on because every day I think, I feel that energy of our people who've passed on as do all of you. They're the ones who help us get up every day and fight for what we need to fight for. But I encourage everyone that in that fight, make sure that each day you are living as a strong, proud, warmu, Nyamba, whatever you are, person. We live each day. We're not survivors. We live. We're evolving. That's who we are as a people. They're not going to lock us in some little cabinet and say, oh, there was a race of Aboriginal people, you know. There were the 500 nations. I've heard all that rubbish. We're a living people. And every day we walk proud with our heads held high. That's the most important thing we can do. One thing my grandmother said to me, which I always uh, keep within my thinking, within my philosophy, within my theorising, whatever I do, when I'm working out what needs to be done in the struggle, she always reminded me, at the end of the day, yes, we are a clan, we're Nuran people, we're emu people, but at the end of the day, you're only responsible for your footprint. I can't be responsible for Michael or for Fred or for anyone else. I can give them guidance, they can give me guidance. At the end of the day, when we're on our spiritual journey, we'll be seen for the footprint we leave. So let's make sure that that footprint is as strong as we can be. Thank you.